Um, uh, Nina, my, my, myself and my wife Nina, we've been married eight years and um, we, we've not had any kids. Um, but I've got a bit of an announcement. My wife's pregnant. <laughs> Nigerian baby. <laughs> awesome, awesome guys. Thank you so much for um, for just your attention and your time. I really have been overwhelmed. Um, I, I've loved going through Romans. We, we, we are going to be concluding um, Romans chapter eight. Um, have you guys enjoyed Romans chapter eight? <laughs> it, I mean, honestly, my encouragement to you is. After this, go and read read the whole of Romans chapter eight. Read the whole book of Romans. It it will cheer you up, uh, no matter what mood you are in. So we're going to be concluding it, uh, and we're going to be reading um, in just a moment. Before I do, I just want to say this: Nigerians <laughs> are the funniest people, and the reason why Nigerians are the funniest people. Uh, because essentially, when you grew up in a Nigerian family, um, like I did, to be, to be honest, if you grew up in an African family, um, <laughs> there is a phenomenon that you get used to. It, it really defies the laws of logic and the rules of etiquette. Um, it's one of the wonders of the world, and it's one of the rights of every African person. And that phenomenon is African time. African time. <laughs> African time is anything from being 30 minutes late uh, to 36 hours late. <laughs> There's a man over there, American Nigerian, that's just like, yes, I know, I feel their pain. I learned about African time uh, from, a, from a young age. I was going to school one day and my mum offered to give me a lift. I was like, that's fine. Bless her, she was running late, she had loads of things to do. I ended up turning up at the school gate 30 minutes late. I turned to my mum and said, mum, what do you want me to say? My mum turned to me and looked at me and said, don't worry, just say African time. <laughs> what she said. I went into the classroom sheepishly. Mrs. Northcott wasn't too happy. Toby Ford Weston, why are you late? I looked at her and I just said, African time. <laughs> that day I recognised that um, British schools don't recognise African time. <laughs> And I swiftly got detention time, actually. <laughs> um, but the reality, I mentioned the surprise at the beginning that my wife is pregnant. I've got another surprise for you, uh, for you. This is something that I've been keeping from you uh, for a few days now. We've really got to know each other over the last few days. And um, quite frankly, you're in the presence of royalty. I'm, um, I'm a Nigerian prince. <laughs> I'm not only a Nigerian prince, I'm chief of many tribes throughout all of Africa. And, uh, and I've got a photo to prove it. But you guys don't want to see the photo, do you? Yeah. Okay. Well, are you ready for this? This proves that I'm a chief and a prince in my kingdom in Africa. <laughs> in my kingdom, sword in hand. Uh, let me, uh, actually, uh, Stephen Dawson asked me to leave all of this just to come this week to preach to you, so you guys are welcome. Um, let, let, me, let me take you through, let me introduce you to some of my friends here. Um, the lion at the front, uh, she's a feisty one. I call her Fantasia. And then we've got the elephant in the back. Um, he, I named after former President of the United States, Barack Obama. So his name is Obama Nikwa. And then we have the monkey in the front, he's a, he's, he's a cheeky one, I call him Frank. And then the cheetah in the middle, I, I did think about what to name the cheetah, I thought, oh, what do I name it? I looked at it and I said, what cheats? And I thought, I've got a perfect name, Tottenham Hotspur. <laughs> Arsenal forever, baby. Now, now, of course, 
Of course, this picture isn't real because I actually have more animals than that. <laughs> and, and being a Nigerian prince, I'll be sending your parents bank details so that they can transfer <laughs> money into it so I can give them the inheritance. <laughs> Just to say, I love Nigeria. But we are, we are going to be concluding Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at the topic of love. Uh, my friend Pete, I believe, is just going to come up and read, then we'll pray, and then we'll get to it. This is from Romans 8, verse 35, 38, 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. Father God, we just ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would pour out the love of God. We ask for an experience like no other. Pray even as I preach, your spirit be pouring out your love. When people see it for the first time, experience it even. We ask that in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Uh, guys, so every single person in this arena uh, wants to be loved. Uh, there's no one here that would say, I don't want to be loved. Uh, myself included, we all want to be loved. It's, it, we're kind of made that way. And the Bible tells a story of a God of love. In fact, the Bible goes further. The Bible doesn't just call God a God of love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says God is love, which means God is the definition of love. The way we know what, God, what love is is by looking at God. The way we know what love is is by looking at Christ. And perhaps you've wondered, uh, you probably would have heard Christians say, God loves you. And that's true. Every single person in this room, God loves. But I wonder if you've ever asked the question, why? Why does God love me? Well, I'll tell you one reason it's not. A reason that God loves you is not because you're a good person. It's not because of your performance, it's not because of your works, it's not because of your morality. And I'll show you an example to prove this. What we have here is a, a seesaw. And uh, this seesaw represents the judgment. And the reality is at the end of life, all of us in here have an appointment booked, already scheduled with, with Jesus. And he will ask questions of us about our lives, about what we have done with our lives, why we chose to do certain things and why we did not choose to do certain things. And, and what we so often think, the, the incorrectly, but what we so often think is the judgment will look like this. Uh, we, we so often think that Jesus is going to get our good works over here. And Jesus is going to get our bad works. I put them over here. And we think that so often that Jesus is going to weigh them and measure them and think, oh, oh good works, 51% come into heaven. That's what we so often think is going to happen at the judgment. I tell you, that this is one of the, 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 the biggest misconceptions of all time. Uh, this is not how the judgment will go at all. Let's take a righteous person. Let's take a, not a righteous person, let's take a moral person. Let's take a, I don't know, a Greta Thunberg. Or let's take a Mother Teresa. Someone who is, we would all say is very moral. Someone who would say, oh, that's, a, that's clearly a good person. Uh, let's say they don't believe in Jesus. The reality is, their judgment, and we're talking about what we would call a, a good person, a righteous, not a righteous, but a good person, a moral person. This is what their judgment would look like. A Jesus will take their bad works. And Jesus will get their good works. And 
And that's what the judgment will look like. Well, hang on a second, Toby. No, you, you've, you've got it wrong. What you're supposed to do is take the good works and put them on, on the good work section. That's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to measure them. No. You see, the Bible says that our righteous deeds, our good works, are like filthy rags, like a polluted garment in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. Our good works are a polluted garment. It's kind of like taking a towel that you've used at New Day and, and dropping the towel on the floor in the shower and dragging it from the shower and through the mud and stomping it in and then presenting that to God Almighty and saying, this is the best thing I've ever done. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of like this. Your, your, your best works. And presenting them to Jesus at the judgment will be like this. That's what it will look like to Jesus. Therefore, our righteous works, our good deeds, they are not acceptable to God. And God, specifically Jesus, classes them as unrighteous works, even though they're our best. Why? Because they're done without him. This is what the judgment will look like for those that have not done a U-turn from going in the wrong direction and come in the direction of Jesus, which is repentance and giving their life to Jesus in faith. That's what the judgment will look like. However, if you believe in Jesus, if you have done just that, and you have repented of all your sins, and Jesus has forgiven you, this is what the judgment for you will look like. Let me explain this first. Uh, at the cross, something happened called the, the Great Exchange. And what that means is essentially, uh, Jesus got punished for your works. What we saw lastly with the, the bad works over there, Jesus got that. He got punished for that. He got what you did, your record, your life, your failed morality, and mine, our, our more failed morality, Jesus got. And in exchange, he swapped it with us. Meaning that he got our record, and we, if we believe in Jesus, get his record, and his record is what we are judged on if you believe in Jesus to get into heaven. And so this is what it looks like. If you're a Christian, Jesus will get, first of all, that he had no bad works. That this section is completely empty because Jesus never sinned. He never even thought anything bad. Thought never once. So the, 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 the bad work section is empty for the Christian because Jesus has given them his uh, record, but the good work section looks something like this. best friend John says if all of the good works of Jesus were written down all of the world would not have sufficient paper to record all of the good that Jesus did and this is what the judgment will look like for you not based on your own merits but based on Jesus's therefore it's not about how good you are it's not about your morality it's not about your performance no 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 God chooses you because he loves you, not because you're a good person, but based on his choice. It is not enough to have the record of a good man. You need the record of the God man. 
You need the record of the government. And so on the, on the basis of that, on the basis of that, Christians aren't necessarily the most moral people. They're not necessarily the, the, the nicest people in the world. Whoever said anything about that? I know people that are not yet Christians that are more moral than me. I'm a, I'm a preacher. But the reality is it's not about morality. It's about being forgiven. That's what really counts with God. He cares about if you've repented of your sin. And if you have, he pours his love into your heart. And I'll give you another example. When Jesus was being crucified, there were two men crucified with Jesus. There was one man to the left, one man to the right. And what you need to understand about a Roman crucifixion was a crucifixion which was reserved only for the very worst people. The people that did such horrible things, but it's not even worth me mentioning on this stage. Crucifixion was reserved for monsters. Monsters. And there was one man that was next to Jesus being crucified, and all of a sudden, something strange happens. From the cross, as he's being crucified, in excruciating pain, literally, he cries out to Jesus in acknowledgement that he deserves what he's getting. Can you imagine, for a person to be crucified in agony, the last few breaths to say, do you know what, I have done such horrible things that actually, do you know what, yeah, I deserve this. He must have done some just horrendous things. Yet he acknowledges it, and then he turns his head to Jesus, if he's able to, and says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Jesus, last few minutes of his life, not concerned about his own pain, he turns his head to this man and he says these words to him. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, Jesus is loving this guy. And you can say, hang on a sec. But this guy, he's been crucified. He's just admitted that he's horrible. He's admitted he deserves to die in this way. And you're saying Jesus loves him? What about his works? What about he's not done any moral stuff? He's done all bad stuff. Jesus loved this guy? Yes. And he loves you too. And I tell you, In fact, if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes for me, just for a, for a moment, if, if I could have every eye closed, every eye is closed, my eyes closed as well, picture in your mind's eye Jesus, the Son of God, in front of you. See him in front of you. Hundreds of you right now are seeing Jesus in your mind's eye. Now what Jesus is doing is he's putting his hand on your shoulder. And Jesus says these words to you if you believe in him. My brother, my sister, one day you will be with me in paradise. You won't have to see me in this way any longer but you will see me face to face that day is coming my brother that day is coming my sister because you've believed in me and Jesus also says this your eyes closed neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in me, Christ Jesus, your Lord. Open your eyes. What Romans 8 is, is showing here, 
Is it showing things that might concern you? Things that you might worry, might separate you from the love of God. It lists things that are natural and supernatural. It lists things that are visible and invisible. It lists things in heaven and earth. And its conclusion is that God's love for you is unbreakable. It is the most wonderful thing of all, perhaps. But you may have heard this before. That God doesn't want rules. He wants a relationship. And in a relationship, it's two ways. So God loves you, but he wants the response from you to, and me to love him back. And you might be here and say, okay, Toby, I want to love God back. But how? Toby, I know, you, you tell me what to do. You tell me how to love God back and, and I'll just do it. Well, one way of loving God back is seen in John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus says this, if you love me, if you, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will obey me. Whoa, 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 whoa. I quite liked it when you were talking about Jesus as my saviour. I quite liked it when you said that there is no condemnation for me. I quite liked it when you said, God will be my father, and he will love me and delight in me and never leave me. I quite liked it when you said, uh, you're going to get a new body and I'm going to get a new uh, playground in heaven. I'm going to live forever. I like that stuff. That's, that's good. Tell me more about that. But don't tell me about having to obey him. Don't tell me about actually having to do what he tells me. New day, I need you to understand this for me. You cannot have Jesus as your saviour and not your Lord. He is both. He is both. He is both saviour and Lord to you, or he is nothing to you. Now, Jesus, Jesus has to be in first place in your life. He needs to be first ahead of your friends. He needs to be first ahead of your schoolwork. He needs to be first ahead of your family. First ahead of your parents. First ahead of yourself. Believe me, I have tried to put Jesus in second place, in third place, in fourth place. Heck, I even tried to put Jesus in last place. And do you know what I find? Jesus doesn't negotiate. <laughs> He's like, I beg your pardon? Third place? No, it's first place. And what does it look like to have Jesus as your Lord? Well, it looks like Jesus being the leader and you being the follower. It means Jesus taking his rightful place in every area of your life. It means following the New Testament teaching on how we should speak, what we should do with our body, who we should marry, what it says about gender and sexuality, what it says about anger, what it says about gossip. It's understanding that the Bible is here, God's word, Jesus' word, and we are under it, and we are to obey it humbly. And that's something of what it means to have Jesus as your Lord, as well as all the wonderful things I've been preaching the last three days as your Savior. And if you know Jesus, you know Jesus, <laughs> he's a risk taker. He's all about getting you and I to take risks. If you're not taking risks for Jesus, if you've met a Jesus that isn't a risk taker, I'm not sure you've met the real Jesus. Because the reality is, as the Lord, Jesus will be getting you to take risks. Things like telling you to break up with your non-Christian boyfriends or girlfriends. 
He will tell you to forgive the people that have hurt you. He will tell you to pray for the people that have hated you. He will tell you to say sorry to your parents. He will tell you to give away your money for his cause. He will tell you to cut off bad friendships causing you to sin. He will tell you to be ruthless with the things tempting you to sin in your life. He will tell you to commit to going and serving in your local church. He will tell you to confess your porn addiction to a youth leader. He will tell you to get baptised in water. But he will also tell you that he loves you. He will also tell you that you have been adopted. He will also tell you that there is no condemnation. He will also tell you that he will never leave you. He will also tell you that he will never forsake you. He will also tell you that God is your father. He will also tell you that he's going to give you a new body. He will also tell you he's going to give you a new creation. He will also tell you that he delights in you. Young man, young woman, I tell you, you must have Jesus both your saviour and your Lord. I tell you, he's worth it. He's worth it. He is. He is. He is. He's so good. Come on, come on. He's so good. And then you might say, you might say, okay. What about, I'm not perfect, Toby. Even if I follow Jesus, I won't be perfect. And let me just ease the burden on you. Jesus, he's not looking for perfection. He is be free. Check it off. He's not looking for perfection. What Jesus is looking for from you, if you believe in him, is just to be wholehearted. Just to give him your all. That will do for him. Give him your all. And you might say this, you might say, okay, Toby, <coughs> you're talking about the love of God. And I've been going to church maybe for a few months. And I've struggled to experience love of God. Actually, it's been quite dry. I've gone to church and I've not really felt anything. Perhaps it's even been quite boring. And you think, well, what about, what about me? What, what's going on? Is there something wrong with me? Maybe you've been a new day these last uh, few days and you've seen people uh, uh, praise God with a loud voice. You've seen people fall down, you've seen people cry, you've seen people laugh hysterically, you've seen people jump up and down, you've seen people receive lots of peace. You think, well, everyone else is receiving this love of God apart from me. Toby, is there something wrong with me? Well, let me say two things to that. And the first thing I'll say is this, that I wake up in the morning, I pray to Jesus and I sing to him. And sometimes, I feel nothing. <laughs> In fact, quite a lot of the time, I don't feel those warm, fuzzy feelings from God. Sometimes I do. And I'm just trying to say, relax. It's not all about your feelings. If it were all about your feelings, your relationship with God would be like this. Because you wake up one day, you feel good. Oh, God loves me. You wake up another day, you just feel rotten. You think, oh, God hates me. And that's no relationship. God doesn't want your, your salvation. God doesn't want your faith to be based on your feelings. He wants your faith to be based on your friend, Jesus. That's what he wants your faith to be based on. And the second thing I'll say is this. That we're talking about love and perhaps one of the, the greatest symbols of love is a, is a marriage. It's a wedding, a marriage. And that marriage is vows are made. And you might not be feeling the love of God. <laughs> But I tell you this, this is what Jesus says to you. Jesus vows to have and to hold you from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. Now you might say, wow. I don't remember God making those vows to me. I, I, I don't remember that at all. Where did God make those vows to me? God made those vows to you at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's where he made those vows. And there is one thing, there is one thing, there is one set of vows that I didn't read off one set of vows that I didn't read of. 
they're common in a traditional uh, wedding. And that is when the person marrying them says, until death do us part. God doesn't make that vow to you because not even death will part you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It's about the So new day, I will close our preaching series on Romans 8 by saying this to you. It's good news. I am sure, listen, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor bulimia, nor not having a mum, nor not having a dad, nor bullying, nor sexual sin, nor being body shamed, nor things at home, nor bad results, nor peer pressure, nor sexual assault, nor addiction, nor depression, nor anxiety, nor panic attacks, nor pornography, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. the week with no condemnation. We end the week with no separation. Yeah. Young man, young woman, run into the invincible love of Jesus. Yeah. 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 Yeah.